They were once nearly extinct, but over the last two decades, wolf populations in Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana have grown to nearly 3,000 thanks to a 1995 reintroduction plan carried out by Yellowstone National Park. Their return has been a giant success for the conservation movement, but a relentless headache for ranchers. Last year, we reported from Yellowstone's border where tensions had reached a fever pitch. This morning, we take you to Colorado, where some wolves have moved in, in on their own and others are about to be released by public mandate amid hope for less conflict and more compromise. Every morning, the typically quiet and empty grasslands west of the Colorado Rockies are awakened by the routine sound of Don Gittleson feeding his cows. He makes a living raising cattle for grass-fed beef and sells selectively bred bulls to producers. So it's just you. Wow, 1,200 acres and you. When the cows go up there, yeah, I'm the one that puts them up there and I'm the one that gets them down on By yourself? Yeah. In an average year, there's a lot to do to keep the ranch running. But at the end of 2021, a new challenge was piled onto his workload. So the first time I saw the male, he was up on the mountain. So that was the first sighting. When was the first kill? So that was, I think, about the 22nd of December. Last winter, seven of his cattle were killed by wolves, four of which he received compensation for from a government program. He's limited in what he can do to defend his herd because this particular pack is protected under the Endangered Species Act. So if I catch them in here at night, I can chase them now. I can't injure them. So I have chased them about three o'clock in the morning. This is the first pack to settle into Colorado in at least 70 years. Scientists trace the female wolf from Northwest Wyoming, 400 miles north of the Gittleson Ranch. These guys, they travel. Oh, they travel. They definitely travel. The pack caught the eye of Colorado University wildlife biologist Joanna Lambert, who studies wolves and coyotes across the country. She's well aware of cases like Gittleson's, where wolves take down livestock instead of natural prey. Yeah, it's a worst case situation, a worst case scenario, absolutely. Ranchers who are right there between those public lands and the private ones are probably the ones who are gonna get hit. Yes, absolutely. But life without wolves has its own set of problems. Deer and elk populations skyrocketed after wolves were wiped out in the early 20th century. It influences all of the other aspects of that biological community that are, and, and it's even, you know, has consequences for erosion in areas if there's massive overgrazing. And coyote populations have been cropping up in unexpected places. So basically, while wolf numbers were going down, coyote numbers have been going up. They are in every state except for Hawaii. They are in every major metropolitan region of the United States. They're in Manhattan. Research like Lambert's showing that returning wolves helps rebalance the ecosystem spurred a campaign that led to Colorado voters deciding to reintroduce them to the state in 2020. We can take politicians out of the picture and create a science-based plan that safely restores wolves to our ecosystems. Let's restore the howl to Colorado. The proposition passed, marking the first time a species would be introduced by ballot. A few dozen wild wolves will be captured, likely from the Yellowstone area, and released on public land in Colorado, beginning as early as this December. Of course, I didn't vote for it. Um, I thought it was a bad idea. But you're left to deal with it. Yeah, it is what it is. The pack that settled around the Gittleson's ranch are unaffiliated with the reintroduction plan. They showed up on their own. But if Gittleson has one hope, it's that the wolves that are reintroduced are not treated so preciously. So if they become a problem like here... You can handle it. They can be put down, yes. Some scientists, including Lambert, agree with Gittleson to some degree. So the experimental status is sort of the gray in a land of black and white. Yeah, it renders the whole kind of experiment 
which essentially reintroduction is, right? It renders it more adaptive. And more of a compromise. Yeah, and, and a compromise. Ultimately, we've all got to kind of cooperate, have conversations about what we are and are not willing to lose. That conversation continues to grow louder as plans to conserve all kinds of native species pick up steam. The goal is, where possible, restore what we've lost. Some habitats are forever lost to urbanization, but there are still millions of acres of protected land that scientists see a potential as homes for beavers, bears, and wolves. Are we attempting to rewild the West? We are indeed, at least in the areas that can support that. And there's so many issues here. One, this is highly emotional for mm -hmm. ranchers. I mean, you can talk science and data, but when they are witnessing kills of their very precious Sure, I mean, we saw the close-up right there. Absolutely. But then, two, you have learned behavior, and these wolves are very smart. When they learn that cows who are uh, less rambunctious than, mm -hmm. say, elk, mm -hmm. they know that's you know, uh, an sure. easy kill. And you really see how delicate the ecosystem is here. You move one little thing and then all the repercussions and the ripple effects of it that. It does. And, you know, we're, we're trying to write 100 years of, mm. of a mistake. Yeah. And it, that's hard to do. Stunning landscape, though. It Great was. Story. Uh, big shout out to Kathleen Seacombe and uh, Ben McCormick. Well done. Us.